Good evening, everybody, and welcome to CAM Cycles November monthly meeting. We are so pleased that you are joining us this evening. If you are new to our online monthly meetings or new to CAM Cycle, um, I'll just say that CAM Cycle, also known as Cambridge Cycling Campaign, is a local charity working for more, better, and safer cycling for all ages and abilities in and around Cambridge. We are a membership charity, so we have uh, uh, many members and we've got some news about that later on in the meeting. Um, we are joined by quite a, a great team from CamCycle this evening. So uh, we have got Robin Hayden, who is the chair of CamCycle. Hi, Robin. Uh, we have got Josh, who is our infrastructure campaigner. Hi, Josh. Anna, our communications and community officer, and Rosie, our admin officer, and I'm Roxanne, I'm the executive director of CamCycle. So that is your CamCycle team this evening. Hello and welcome. And we have our guest speakers, Alistair and Nick from the GCP, and more on that soon. So we know that's why you're here, to learn more about the sustainable travel zone. And if you haven't heard of it, where have you been? Well, today is the day to learn more. I would like to uh, set a bit of context before we kick off with this evening's meeting. So this is CamCycle's members monthly meeting. Uh, we hold these meetings every month, either online or in person and have done for many, many years or decades, I should say. Um, and they've always been open to the public. So everybody's welcome to our meeting this evening, but this is a CamCycle members monthly meeting. Um, and while we do welcome all questions, they should be relevant to transport issues, cycling issues, um, and of course, they should be polite and respectful. Um, Cam Cycle, uh, the, the team has submitted a, or sent out a survey to our members because we wanted to know how our members felt about the idea of a sustainable travel zone. And over 88% of our members who responded to that survey said that they support the idea. Um, so that is why CamCycle has taken the position that we support the concept of a sustainable travel zone, but of course it's in the detail and we are looking at that detail very closely and we want our members to also look at the detail very closely, hence why we have our wonderful guest this evening to tell us more about the sustainable travel zone. But that's the basis on, on which this meeting is held. Um, in general, we have support for this proposal. This is a members meeting for our members to find out more, but we are very welcome to um, for anyone to join our meeting and learn more about not only the sustainable travel zone proposals, but also more about CAM cycle and, and how we approach uh, issues such as the one in front of us today. So there'll be opportunities to ask our guest speakers question, but also, um, of course, we welcome questions of the CAM cycle team and hence why so many of us are here this evening. Uh, I think that is all the things I'm supposed to say for the evening uh, so far. We will hand over to Robin to chair this session and there will be more updates from CAM cycle after our guest speakers, including more insights on the survey that we ran with our members. So thank you everyone for joining us. I shall mute and hand over to you, Robin. Thank you, Roxanne. So as Roxanne said, the Greater Cambridge Partnership has started a consultation on the sustainable travel zone. According to the Greater Cambridge Partnership, their proposals will create faster, cheaper, more reliable bus services, as well as investment in better walking and cycling routes. As somebody who owns a car and cycles and drives in and around Cambridge, I'm very interested to hear how these proposals will impact me when driving, when cycling, or when I use the bus. I've said for a long time that people should be given a choice of how to move around the city. If somebody only has a choice of driving, then nobody should blame them or criticize them for driving. I'm also skeptical that the only tangible cycling improvements mentioned include 12 greenway routes. Given that they've been approved since 2018, with the assembly saying at that time that they were a quick win, I've yet to see a single new greenway being built over the last four years. So I'm concerned about how these would get built before any sustainable travel zone is introduced. I'm also interested in other options that were not carried forward. For example, why aren't any big businesses being taxed with a workplace parking levy, given that they cause a lot of traffic, 
or why all the new business parks are being stuck out in remote places without public transport or cycling infrastructure. As a reminder, this is a public meeting and people are welcome, whatever their views, to participate politely and in a respectful manner. I'm sure that during the presentation, you will have questions. If you want to ask a question, please type it into chat and we'll ask as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. We are time limited, so I may not have enough time for every question. And if I have multiple questions that are very similar, I may combine them together into a single question. As already mentioned, CamCycle is a member-led organization. And even within CamCycle, we have a wide range of views about the sustainable travel zone. And we are still discussing the details of our response. My hope is that CamCycle members can get a better understanding of the proposals to allow us to have a clear sense of what we would collectively like and what we would like changed. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Alistair Cox and Nick Sanderson. Mr. Cox is the Technical Director for Sustainable Travel Zone. He's a Chartered Transport Planner with over 25 years experience ranging from policy to scheme delivery and has been a champion of cycling throughout his career. During his 17 years in the public sector, he has worked at the senior management level and has a track record of developing and delivering sustainable travel schemes. For example, he led the adoption of Dutch style infrastructure as part of the Bristol cycling strategy, alongside securing funding for infrastructure and behavioral change method, uh, measures in Bristol. Mr. Sanderson is a consultant contractor to the GCP and is involved in the consultation engagement. He is online here to help answer questions about the consultation in itself. So let's move to the presentation. Over to you, Alistair. Yes, so as the introduction said, I'm here to talk to you about the, the current consultation for making connections. Uh, and really on this opening slide, what we're just trying to convey across here really is it's a lot of the premise of what we've been looking at is, uh, the, is the imagine if we lived in a place that prioritised people over cars. And this is the vision we've employed throughout the development of this proposed package of interventions. And it's about not just transforming the way we travel, but supporting in a uh, transformation of how we live really in terms of our, our city and our spaces. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So Greater Cambridge faces a range of urgent issues which are related to how we travel. Uh, and I'm not going to read the, the, all the bullet points out, you can read those for yourselves, but uh, you know, the crux of this is that congestion is clogging our roads up, it's making journeys slow, unreliable, and it's contributing towards poor air quality, high, high carbon emissions. And actually in terms of the way our, 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 our cities operate, is it this, this isn't a very efficient way of moving people either. Um, so. Um, this is what we're trying to do really is come up with a way to move more people more efficiently more sustainably and also open up more opportunities and I think it's important to stress that people miss out on opportunities because of the way our current transport system works um, the, the, the lowest um, part of our population have the, the the lowest level of car ownership and actually that does mean people are denied opportunities for employment opportunities to access leisure education and training as well um, so what we're trying to do is pull together a package of measures that will get more people to walk, cycle and use public transport. And we'll do this through improved bus services and better facilities for walking and cycling. And this will really enough for people other forms of travel as a, a natural first choice uh, and as an alternative to car for many people. And it's these measures that will come together that we think will keep Cambridge moving and um, being prosperous and sustainable into the future. Uh, next slide, please. It's important to stress that this consultation we're talking about today is part of a much bigger plan which Greater Cambridge Partnership is, is leading. Um, so the, the wider investment programme includes four new busways, uh, 10,000 extra parking ride spaces, uh, the greenways have been mentioned already, but also cross city cycling routes, uh, improved bus walking and cycling measures, um, a review of the network itself, uh, a parking strategy, and, and new rail connections as well. So really this is forming part of a, a whole package of measures which are uh, designed to provide a different way of people being able to move around uh, in, into the future. Next slide, please. So what we're just um, summarizing on here is the results of some of the recent consultation in 2021, but the, uh, the conversation around issues in Cambridge actually has been spanning back um, a long period of time. In this current um, form of Greater Cambridge Partnership, there was a big conversation in 2018, and then there was a, a consultation called Choices for Better Journeys in 2019. 
Um, what we're showing on the screen here is in terms of the recent consultation towards the, the back end of last year, there was um, a majority of people supporting um, tackling carbon emissions, pollution, uh, a majority of people supported bus proposals, and then a significant support uh, also for the idea of reducing traffic um, uh, to improve walking and cycling, but also for public transport. That consultation also talked about three ways of potentially trying to um, reduce demand for car travel and also raise some of the money needed to fund the, pa the package. Um, the preference was for a flexible or pollution charge, so some sort of road charge over parking charges um, as a preferred way forward. Uh, the preference was for a lower charge covering a larger area with a small majority in favour of peak only time charges. And there was a preference on spending um, new money on more frequent bus services, cheaper bus fares, longer operating hours and more direct services as well. Uh, next slide, please. So our proposals are split into three main components. Uh, the first is transforming the bus network um, through more services, more locations, longer hours and cheaper fares. Uh, the second area is around investment in sustainable travel, such as walking and cycling. And the third area is the sustainable travel zone, which is a mechanism where people would pay to drive and that revenue is ring fenced. So kept into a pot, which is only to be spent on transport um, alongside some discounts, exemptions and reimbursements available as well. Um, we'll go through each, each of these one by one, but the point to stress is that from mid 2023, we're proposing to start the programme of improvement to, to buses uh, through service enhancements, through to lower fares being introduced in 2024 onwards. Uh, and then the actual sustainable travel zone is we're not looking to make that fully operational till 2027 or 2028. We come back to that later in the presentation. But part of the, this consultation is exploring options about whether there are certain elements could, could, that be, could be phased in sooner. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the first area, buses, um, what we're proposing really here is the biggest shake up of bus service outside London since the bus service was deregulated. And it's, it's, this is one area we recognise it's been hard for people to really um, grasp what we're, we're proposing, I suppose, because it's, you know, buses haven't really changed much in the last 20 or 30 years. But we're talking about essentially um, doubling the size of the bus operations um, in the area uh, with a much bigger role for park and ride, with a role for travel hub and interchanges. But critically, buses will be running from early in the morning to late at night, um, seven days a week with the uh, reduced fares. There'll be new orbital services and it will be that you know, people have a means of getting around uh, that they don't currently have. Uh, next slide, please. So the key elements we're proposing are the cheap fares, so a £1, £2 flat fare, so £1 for any journeys in the city and £2 from journeys starting outside. Um, higher frequencies and faster services. So where there are buses, there'll be more often, but also for some of the longer journeys, there'll be faster expressor services. Um, new routes. So we're going to be doubling the size of the network, introducing routes that go orbital, go around, instead of just going in and out of the city centre, but also ensuring that rural areas have access to buses as well through um, demand responsive or book of buses, which operate um, similar to sort of Uber taxis, but in, in bus form. Um, we, we want to make the buses more reliable um, through providing more bus priority, but critically actually the, the moving um, congestion from our road is what allowed them to, to operate often without the bus priority. Uh, longer hours, so from around five in the morning to, to one in the morning on, on the majority of the network um, and better infrastructure as well in terms of not just the, um, the service, the number of buses, but also the, the quality of the bus stops, the quality of the buses, the quality of the overall ride experience itself, plus tap on, tap off ticketing. So we're able to cap fares and give people good value. Um, and although they're not part of this stage, we have acknowledged that we need to look at things such as family tickets and other ways of providing better value discount for, for people as well as part of the next stage. Next slide, please. So beyond buses, um, we're putting together a package of investing in sustainable travel. This includes focusing on the following areas, so more cycling and walking connections, including the 13 corridors we've identified in the Cycling Plus programme, um, bicycle parking, um, extending the Greenway network, looking at public spaces in our public realm and how we can prioritise those to be more people friendly, making our city more accessible for all 
and plus giving people more access to things such as car clubs so people can benefit from access to car uh, but not necessarily having to um to own a car or could reduce from a third car to three car to two car household or, or so on so it's about trying to provide a whole range of solutions to try and help people move forward it's probably worth stressing at this stage that is um at this stage of the proposal some of these are things we're looking to explore with stakeholders and, and through the consultations. We don't necessarily have answers to all these things at this stage, but very much we're looking to provide an opportunity to develop the funding streams so these things can be developed and taken forward. Next slide, please. And so the final strand is the sustainable travel zone. So a sustainable travel zone is an area where vehicles which will be charged for driving at certain times of the day. So we are proposing um, when it's fully operational, Private cars will be charged five pounds to drive uh, within the within the zone, which is essentially the, the, the urban area of Cambridge. Um, other vehicles will be charged different amounts, so larger vehicles may be charged more. We're proposing to develop this uh, sustainable travel zone over time, um, so gradually introducing it to be an all day by 2027 27 or 2028. But as I said, as part of the consultation, looking at options how that could be phased in, uh, potentially for larger vehicles in 2025. Uh, potentially a peak only scheme in the morning peak in 2026 uh, to be fully operational by 2027 2028 and this scheme provides the benefits of reducing traffic um, but also providing that income stream so we have money available to support the buses and to support wider, wider sustainable transport measures uh, without which those improvements would not be deliverable uh, next slide please so what would a sustainable transport zone mean in terms of when it's in place and it's fully fully operational? So from the work we've done to date, it's estimated that the car trips within that zone would reduce by about 50%. Um, and I think it's not to be um, underplayed just how significant that is. Most of our transport schemes I've been involved in over the last 20, 30 years, you know, we're talking about uh, maybe one or two percent, three percent reductions and, and so on. So a scheme that can actually reduce car trips by 50 percent would be transformational in terms of how the city looks and operates and the space it creates and the sort of environment it is. Um, as I've touched on already, it will give us critically that income stream so we can actually fund the necessary improvements. We can fund a public transport network that actually runs when people need it. They can depend on it from early in the morning to late at night for the sorts of fares that are affordable. And as a consequence, um, the work we've done so far indicates around a 40% increase in public transport will be the outcome and about 60,000 more journeys made by bike and foot. Um, and as I said, the, the, the long-term funding stream creates that possibility as well to look at wider sustainable transport measures beyond the buses as well, to really allow us to enhance mobility and connect people where they need to go. Next slide, please. So in terms of the proposed charges, so the sustainable travel zone is proposed to operate on weekdays, Monday to Friday, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And the charges are shown on, on the slide there. So the charge we paid just once. So if you if you pay the charge in the morning, you, you wouldn't pay the charge again if you moved your car later that day. It's a single charge for the whole day. And what we're proposing is um, initially five pound for the, for the cars in, and, and motorbikes, but then what we're suggesting is for larger vehicles, given that they cause more congestion but also um, more pollution that they would be charged proportionally more but to try and incentivize some of those vehicles that will be probably necessarily on the, on the network doing deliveries and so on and is that we would then explore discounts for zero emission vehicles um, registered bus services would be 100 percent discounts wouldn't be charged but again in 2030 we would review this because the um the current policy position is it to have a, a fully electric bus fleet by 2030 so we'd review then uh, if there are still parts of the fleet that aren't zero emission and we need to do more. We have considered higher charges um, and they do they did reduce traffic even further. But what we find is this this five pound charge was, was getting the balance about right in terms of it was reducing the traffic to a level that was you know transformational in terms of impacts, uh, but also raising enough money to be able to fund the alternatives. And um, what, what we found of higher charges actually would be uh, deterring even more traffic off the road and raising more money than was probably needed to fund the, 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 the alternative package of buses and sustainable transport. So we've tried to reach a level of charge. This is, a, this is in balance with what we need to achieve in terms of the objectives. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so certain vehicles will be exempted or, or discounts, uh, discounted 
uh, charges and there'll also be a potential range of reimbursements as well. Um, so what we're showing on the screen here is um, the exempt vehicles are largely similar to um, the London congestion charge, but also some of the other clean air zones around the country. We've taken a view based on the equalities impact assessment work we've done to date that we need to look at some of the um, some groups in particular to make sure that we do um, cater for them and provide support. So for uh, blue badge holders, we're suggesting up to two vehicles will get can be registered to receive a 100 percent discount, so free travel. Um, but we've also acknowledged it um, for low income households and individuals, then we need to look at some sort of discount for that. So we are looking to develop that as part of this consultation goes on, um, but there's a range of existing discounts available, which the, the city and county provide to people on low income. So we would look to, to basically piggyback on some of those systems and provide uh, a mechanism to offer discounts to people on low incomes as well. Uh, and we're also suggesting a car club vehicles, which are part of the solution, would be given 100% discount. Then in terms of things such as um, some critical needs, such as uh, uh, access to hospital appointments for people who are unable to use public transport, there'd be reimbursement schemes and things such as access to, to A&E as well, plus targeted schemes about specialist uh, equipment carrying for NHS, social care, uh, charities and, and groups that may need to um, use vehicles to support their day-to-day -day duties. Um, it's, it's fair to say this is very much a, a conversation. Um, these are a starter for 10, but the whole point of this, this consultation engagement is to understand um, views from people about what may be difficult but maybe more more challenging to do still so we can look to try and consider and come together with a, a, a package that addresses as many needs as we can uh, next slide please so the timeline so this is about where we would go from here um, if it goes forward following the consultation so the consultation ends in december this year uh, and there would need to be some sort of final decision by the county council um, by the middle of next year if it were to move um, beyond in this time as we've shown. And what we're really trying to show on here then is, is, a, is I've tried to articulate earlier, is that the priority is to get on with improving some of the bus service improvements from 2023 onwards. And then there'll be a, a run-in of, 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 of running in service improvements, um, the fare reductions, and then we start to move towards 25 and 26, starting to run the buses from early in the morning to later at night, starting to look at the demand response if the bookable buses, and really starting to grow that network so it's in a place so people can feel confident that there is an alternative in place before the full um, scheme would go live in 2027 or 2028. Uh, next slide, please. And as hopefully you're all aware, um, but we're, we're obviously plugging it again now. Um, this is very much a, a conversation over the next, um, I think another six to seven weeks at least to go. Um, so we're very much looking for people to come in um, look at the website, um, look at the information, you can fill in questionnaires online, but there's also a series of in-person events and drop-in events and opportunities to come in and talk to us uh, and ask us questions and, um, you know, we'll do our best to, to answer questions where we can, but if we can't answer people's questions directly, we're happy to take details and also respond to people with, with more information so we can try and um, answer, answer the questions. And really, we want to encourage people to have their views, positive, negative, um, you know, clarifications uh, as much as you can over the coming weeks, because we do really want this to be a genuine consultation. So we can take all these, this feedback together, and that we put into, um, you know, analysis and reports. And then our decision makers will obviously then have to make a, a decision about where to go next with this proposition. So that's probably all I wanted to cover um, in terms of the presentation. So I shall uh, stop talking now and happy to um, take questions, please. Well, we've had many, many questions. Um, so the first question we have is, is there a website available to explain the proposals and talk through the possible questions people may have uh, and uh, the projects that are planned and are in the pipeline to deliver this? Yes, so um, the, the, the Greater Cambridge org site which you can still see on the screen would be the best place to visit which has the details of this consultation but also as part of that um, website you can also see the information on the other um, projects and programs which are being taken forward by the greater cambridge partnership as well okay great uh next question there's a lot of misinformation about the proposals out in the community what is the greater cambridge partnership doing to correct um those uh, uh, pieces of information and get the right information out there um 
Well, I think we're, we're doing what we can in terms of there's a, a big program of events online and, and face to face and there's the website and there's um, social media activity and um, a lot of press and um, interviews and in, in, in engagement as well. But I think it's probably um, probably inevitable that, that you know, sound bites and information in unintentionally often in many cases people don't know what's being proposed. So we, we're, we're doing what we can. Um, but it's a it's a it's a busy old space social media as well so uh, you know to a certain extent we're kind of dependent on people who um who have engaged also to share links and, and point them to the, the consultation website really which is where uh, the main port of call for finding what we are proposing and on there there's also a um the ability to um get in touch with us as well if people have specific questions and so on okay um is uh, so you mentioned that uh, there'll be 60,000 more bike and walking journeys. Um, but with other forms of transport, you mentioned a percentage increase. Do you know what the percentage increase is for walking and cycling to get to that 60,000? Um, not off the top of my head, but as, you, as we keep talking, I can find it on another slide deck um, and come back to that one if that's OK. So I'll make a note to uh, come back. But it, it was uh, it's uh, for memory it's something like 30 percent. But I can I can confirm that a 30 percent increase. Yes, it was it's a significant increase, but I'll I'll try and just find it whilst we're talking confirm just so I haven't misled anybody. OK, just as a follow up from that with that extra 30% of people walking and cycling, what will be done to make the streets and junctions safer? So there's the, obviously the existing programmes and measures in place. Um, beyond that, we've been quite open in terms of the, um, the work we've done to date, that there's more work to be defined in terms of what extra infrastructure may be needed to, to provide for these increased flows. So we, we um, the level of work we've done so far is called a strategic outline case. So it's a fairly high level um, proposition in terms of the, the proposal. So we don't have specific designs or drawings or corridors at this stage for other routes, but we are recognizing that's the conversation that needs to happen um, from this point onwards in terms of uh, what, what else needs to happen on top of the, the 13 city routes and the greenways, et cetera, in order to deliver that long-term network of um, travel corridors for people to, to go by bike or by foot. Okay, um, so a lot of infrastructure is planned to enable the increase in bus provision. Um, given the current rate of progress with projects that have already been planned for years, how can it be possible to start the, the sustainable travel zone in three years' time? Um, the questioner asks, I can't imagine that anything will be built by then. So the majority of the, the proposals we've put forward in these the slides for bus improvements are about service improvements as opposed to infrastructure. So the, it's, um, the fares reduction themselves are a considerable part of that. They're about um, 18 to 20 million pounds a year to get one pound and two pound fares across the whole, the whole network. And then the actual bus service improvements to run buses early in the morning to late at night um, to ensure there's demand responsive services for people who live in um, more remote locations that all effectively is going to require a subsidized bus service so the the current way buses are run is they're largely commercial um, and if they don't make money then the bus operators don't run them so we're effectively sort of proposing a different model for funding and running the bus services so of the, the enhancements we're putting forward they're predominantly service-based obviously i think what your question's referring to is some of the broader infrastructure schemes in the program isn't it um, which are currently programmed to be delivered by about 2027 I think for the, the busways and so on. So they should be completed in operation alongside this, this scheme as well. Okay. Uh, another question um, around motor vehicle numbers this time. How far can motor vehicle numbers be reduced before there is not enough to fund this new bus network? Have you done a sensitivity analysis on this and how much room for maneuver is there? Um, yes, I mean, we, we're so, uh, so, to be clear, the current proposal um, is we are forecasting about 50% of the cars that are driving within the zone currently would not be driving once it's fully operational. So that is a significant reduction um, in terms of, of traffic. We, we've looked at sensitivities beyond that. And it's a bit of a sort of, um, um, it's a bit more nuanced, I suppose, because 
if less people did drive, so if it was more than 50% reduced, it does mean we've got more people also traveling on the buses as well as other forms of transport. So we've got more passengers on the buses, so therefore some of the subsidy we need will also reduce. So it's a bit of a kind of a, a mix of working it through, but we've done a range of scenarios. So we think, you know, our central case is 50%, but we think it could, it could vary around that and it works. But as part of the next stage, if we were to take this forward, there's a lot more detailed design work and a lot more work for us to do in terms of developing those uh, proposals and cost them to make sure it all st still works. But you know, there is going to be a degree of um, um, monitoring this in when it goes in anyway, because um, to think we can predict exactly the bus service people need in five years from now, we need to constantly adapting and tweaking it is a, a real life project anyway to make sure we've got the best um, bus service and measures that provide for what people need anyway. Okay, uh, next question. These are just going to keep coming. Um, so how will improved bus services be funded in the period between the time services are improved and the time when the charges are started to be phased in? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's a good question. So um, the Greater Cambridge Partnership is putting in some money from its programme. So it's got 50 million set aside to pump prime to start to fund some of those measures in advance. Um, and then from the broader pot of funding available, we can um, overcommit some more of that funding and then it can be paid back from the charging scheme once it's in place. So there's a significant front loading of expenditure before the charge kicks in. Um, but that's been done explicitly because we recognise that we have to have the improvements in place for people to feel comfortable and confident that it is going to work before the charging scheme starts. So it's being funded from the Greater Cambridge Partnership pot. Some of that will be sunk investment. Some of it will be repaid from the scheme to go and fund, to go and fund other things in, in the programme as it goes forward. OK. Um, many experts argue that franchising is essential to make the buses work. Um, why is this not an integral part of these plans? So franchising isn't within the, the gift of the Greater Cambridge Partnership. It sits with the um, combined authority for Cambridge and Peterborough. Um, so the mayor has already said it's in the consultation brochure that they're taking forward looking at franchising in tandem to this consultation. So I think it's fair to say that franchising would be the easiest way to deliver these improvements, but there would be ways and means of delivering some of these improvements if franchising weren't to happen. But the mayor has been very clear that that's a, a conversation that he wants to take forward about franchising. So we'll be working alongside that consultation and those considerations by the combined authority. Okay. Um, there is much scepticism on the practical ability to provide a good bus service. How many more buses and drivers are needed that are currently in use and what organization will run that those buses? And there's a follow-up question around how will they all uh, fit without significant changes to the current bus station arrangements? Yes, they are. They are. They are all very good questions. So, we are looking at, and that's partly why we're looking at phasing this in over a four or five year period because the ramping up. So, we're talking about approximately doubling the size of the, the bus fleet overall, just just under. Um, so, you know, it's it's a significant increase in buses with drivers. There'll be need to secure additional depot space uh, and you know facilities such as EV charging for electric buses. Um, we have we have factored into our, our work and our costings that we will need to offer more attractive salaries to the bus driver market because recruiting drivers is a challenge now so there would need to be a shift in that um, and it would be delivered um, I think that for the last question previously highlighted really is either through franchising or through other means should franchising not be taken forward by the combined authority so that's a, a separate kind of piece of work which is which is being um, undertaken and led by uh, the mayor and the combined authority. Okay. Um, follow up on that one. What do you think it will take to get people to think that this is actually going to work? Um, I think it will take things to, to, to happen for people to, to believe it, really. I mean, I, I think there's a, a lack of belief that buses will improve because they have people haven't seen a lot of things happen over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, and obviously in this the particular payment um, post COVID bus ridership is lower uh, and the government funding is being turned off. So we're seeing now bus operators uh, 
withdrawing bus services. So people obviously are, you know, people's confidence probably in, in the bus network to change is, is probably as is, is low as it has been. And I suppose that's what we're trying to get across is this is not a, a, a slight change. It's a transformation of what we're, of the bus network in, in, in the area um, with a, a doubling in scale. You know, we're, we're trying to get people to think about more of a London type experience where people might have access to public transport when they want it. They've got access to car clubs. You've got a way of living, which you become less dependent on on the cars your sole mean of getting around so um i think people are right to be concerned are right to doubt us and really our, our job is to put forward a program and should the politicians decide to proceed is, is to make it happen and i think you know, a lot of people will probably want to to see it happen before they believe that we are going to do it is the honest answer um okay uh, let's let's move the topic a little bit onto uh buses although we've been covering buses a little bit, but the actual design of buses. Um, is there going to be more flexible space for wheelchairs, pushchairs, foldable bikes, um, multi-door boarding and multi-door um, uh, lighting from buses, uh, as in London, where it's much easier to just hop onto the back of a bus or the middle of a bus or the front of the bus? Um, I, I couldn't ask all about the, the multi-door bit. I'd have to come back to you on that. But I mean, that's certainly something you could be looked at. I know and it's very successful elsewhere. But yes, in, in the consultation, we are committing that we need to have more space, more flexible space, so people can use them for buggies, wheelchairs, et cetera, uh, so that they're able to get around. Because um, that is one of the one of the issues that's been highlighted, um, one of the constraints of the current network. So yes, the commitment is to make them more accessible um, so they're more usable for everybody. Okay, is there a possibility of buses that carry bicycles, for example, as luggage underneath the bus or using racks on the back? Because um, this would greatly enhance flexibility for people who live in villages and cycle to a bus stop and then want to cycle at the other end. So it, we haven't gone to that level of, of thinking so far. I know from my last job working at, at Bristol City Council, it's something which got raised quite often there. I think it's something we could look at is the honest answer. I, I, I couldn't say, yes, it's definitely going to happen because um, we'd have to work with operators and, and understand you know, their, their views and safety implications. But I know it has been done in other locations. So it's something which definitely ought to be in the pot, as you say, particularly for um, some of the more um, rural services, because that could then enable bikes to be, get to hubs and, and so on to be used for, for onward, con onward, onward connections. OK, um, moving on towards charging. Um, Let's, let's have a simple one, first of all. Would school buses taking children to go to a swimming lesson uh, have to pay a charge? Um, that's a good question. Um, it was a very good question. Thank you. <laughs> so the answer is, is is probably not, but we'd have to look at the, the detail of that because it's how they get sort of registered in terms of their, their classifications. But the uh, the um, but we, we we're looking at sort of... Um, the exemptions and discounts piece as a whole so um that's that's not one which has come up in terms of a specific list but i think it's something we'd have to look at in terms of how how we could address those sorts of situations okay um why are mopeds the same price as cars and a follow-up from that are would electric scooters mopeds or motorbikes uh be considered to be exempt so the only vehicles could be charged, the ones that are um, registered with DVLA, so they have a, a registration plate. So things like electric scooters uh, and, and um, electric bikes that have pedals are not classed as motor vehicles, so they don't, they don't pay. Um, there's been quite a, a debate in developing this, and, and I think there's a longer, longer in debate, a consultation about should motorbikes and mopeds be charged? Um, so the decision we've reached out of sort of considering it carefully is that um, we are trying to reduce pollution and encourage sustainable travel. Um, whilst smaller mo motorbikes and mopeds can have less emissions per vehicle, once you start looking at per passenger ve um, po um, po uh, pollutants, then it starts to get a little bit, a little bit closer, a, bit, a little bit less clear. But overall, we're trying to take a view that we're trying to encourage the, the non-motorised modes uh, and public transport, so walking, cycling, public transport. So. I think it's one we'll get lots of views on, and it's one we didn't bunch, jump to an easy solution on ourselves. It, it, it's a complicated one, um, but I think our overview was, overall view was we think um, we would like to discourage a large uptake in motorbikes and mopeds as a consequence of the charge, and there would be some, some concerns about um, the safety implications to those users, actually, more than anything else, in terms of a big uptake in, in people using motorbikes and mopeds. Okay, uh, next question. Why is Fenditton 
halved out of the sustainable transport zone. In terms of, sorry. Uh, Fenditon is outside um, of the zone, but um, Abbey uh, is not, for example. Okay, um, so we've we've taken the zone to be largely the urban area, and we've tried to look at where we think there are, are natural boundaries in, in places for it to, to sit. Um, so often it's where there's a route which you can travel around instead of traveling, um, having to go through the zone to get, get around as well. So um, whenever you come up with a, with a boundary for this sort of scheme, it's invariably going to be sort of, you know, challenging that um, wherever you put the boundary, the, 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 the people on the, 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 the the, the outside of it or the inside of it have different views about where that should be but we've kind of worked our way around the city to try and find what we think is a logical place in terms of capturing the city as a whole but also not charging for some routes that could be used um, for avoiding the charge for traffic that isn't intended to go into the zone and we've also tried to ensure that we can have access to all the park and ride sites without having to pay the charge as well so that obviously people can choose to use park and ride to access the city if they didn't want to pay the charge. Okay, what about delivery vehicles in the city centre? Um, policies that end up driving small businesses out of the city centre would surely be an own goal. Yeah, so, um, sorry, excuse me, so I'm just trying to install itself on an update on my computer, give me one second. Um, so we, we've put in the consultation brochure, again, in this in this kind of bundle of, of things we need to develop around sustainable transport. Um, so. Um, the consolidation centres have been looked at in Cambridge before and there hasn't really been demand for them but this charge may then give us that kind of critical mass to support that but also then funding could be looked to support things such as e-cargo bikes in, in, in sort of more micro consolidation to support businesses and city centres and other locations as well so I think we recognise that um, um, we don't want to, to damage the economy but you know but um, th these are relatively modest charges and of course it um, firms that are making deliveries will be able to make deliveries in a far more efficient, reliable way as well. So it should free up a lot of their time for not being stuck in the traffic themselves as well. So on balance, we think there's a, a range of things we can do. Uh, and as I said, you know, as part of the next stage, we'd look to see how we can support things such as um, e-cargo consolidation and, and freight consolidation. So there's more options as well for people to, to take, it, uh, uh, take advantage of those. Hey, simple question now. Why is the charge from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m.? Um, it, it's, it's a good question. So we've looked at a range of, of time periods. We wanted a period which spanned both the morning and evening peak. Uh, and we have considered things such as peak only charges, but that tends to then sort of force traffic to be um, trying to get around on the, on the network during the middle of the day. It makes it almost busier and more, and more unpleasant. So We've, when we've this has been developed um, over the last 12 months, these proposals, but it actually it's been looked at going back for probably 10 years plus or more. So the, the, the general conclusion was that the only way you can really make a real difference is if there's a charge for um, the, the majority of the, the day for most people from seven to seven. Uh, and if you do something sort of in between that, you don't get the traffic reduction, but you're also not getting the, uh, the revenue to fund the improvements you need to, to, to make as well. Okay, uh, the various political parties have made various statements on this. Do you have any um, opinions on how your proposals align? Um, it's not really appropriate for me to, to comment on the, the, the political parties. I think we welcome, obviously, the engagement of, of everybody in terms of views on this. So, um, you know, the, uh, the, the proposal's been developed and gone through the, the, um, the Joint Assembly and in, in the Executive Board of Great Cambridge Partnership. Um, and you know we're, we're here to, to talk to yourselves, the public stakeholders, and and um, you know the, the politicians in terms of what we're proposing and their views on it. Really. Okay. Um, a system of free trips per month has been suggested by some as a way to improve public acceptance, especially for people who drive very infrequently on a weekday. Mm. Um, is that something that has been considered? So I think um, what we've been saying is those are things that we need to look at as part of the next stage. So there's been a number of concerns raised, as you said, that people say, well, what if I need, need to use my car for my once a month X or, or you know, a couple of times a month um, trip for, for another purpose? So we recognise there's a big transition. We recognise there's a big change, even even if even it is going to be, um, you know, five years or so before it's an all day scheme. So um, 
it's that sort of comment, that sort of feedback we need to, to put in the melting pot, really, to look at as part of the next stage, should the politicians decide to progress with the scheme. OK, and by that answer, I am assuming that those things are open uh, as part of the consultation. Yeah, I mean, so, yes, this is a, a genuine consultation and we, we want people's views. And, you know, it's the same with the bus measures. We're not saying we've got them right. People will come forward with other ideas for how routes or service changes they want to see. And, and that's that's what we want to hear. We want to hear the good, the bad, the positive, the negative. We want all the views, you know, people to feel they un a, understand what we're proposing. And that's what we're on calls like tonight for, so trying to make sure people can you know, get a sense of what we're saying. Um, but, yeah, we, 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 want, we genuinely want people to engage and give us their their feedback because it's only in doing so that uh, we can help make sense of it all and the, the politicians can decide um, if they want to proceed and if so, how. OK, uh, another question on this sort of theme. Why aren't simpler things like a workplace parking levy um, being considered? So that has been considered as part of the previous consultation. Um, <clears throat> and overall, there was more support for looking at a sort of a, a charge for driving instead. Um, they do also have limitations in terms of um, they don't reduce that much traffic on their own. Because um, so if you look at Nottingham, for example, only about five to maybe 10 percent maximum of parking spaces have been reduced as a result of the charge. So they, they are raising money and they are funding a broader programme, but it's a broader programme of measures that still um, create the, the shift to sustainable travel. So a workplace parking level on its own wouldn't reduce congestion significantly in, in Cambridge. It would raise some money, but there would need to be other things considered then um, to try and um, dissuade traffic. And those sorts of things have been consulted on the past, such as um, traffic control points and, and other things that people probably on the call can recognise from going back five years, 10 years and more. So um, there's been a whole range of options looked at and, it, and it's felt that this is the, the best way forward in terms of um, trying to, to tackle the congestion and, and raise the money. OK, will free buses for seniors continue under the sustainable travel zone proposals? Yes, it won't affect any of the um, concessionary fare um, free travel that's already in, in place that would that carries on. OK, good. Um, would people have to pay to leave the zone even if they live right on the edge, like one street away from the edge? So that is yes is the honest answer um that's one of the the, the um sort of i suppose the downsides of the current technology is it they only allows to do zone based sort of systems or cordon based systems so if you were uh, if, if you drove your car in the zone then you then you are liable to to pay the charge during the hours of operation um there are obviously as you said on the, the, the discount slide and reimbursements there will be low income discounts and other things in place as well but but yes if you do um if you do drive then you would have to to, to, to be liable to pay the charge are there plans to reconsider the current bus routes? Uh, for example, uh, some routes could be designed to be more circular in nature. Um, are, are there plans to consult with passengers of those buses to uh, say how their routes could be improved? Yes. So if you look at the, um, if, if anyone goes to the consultation page, there's a, a, a a series of bus maps and there's also a, an interactive planner as you can see um, but particularly um, for the, the urban area we're proposing all the bus routes which go round as well as into the city so the, one of the problems with most bus networks in the UK is they just all go into city centres and they go out again so if you want to go round you have to go in and out so we're now proposing you can go round um, so from the park and ride you'll be able to get any of the any of the, the, the jobs for example at any other locations going in a circular route um, so that will help move things forward in terms of engagement um there'll be a lot more engagement if we if we took this forward in terms of developing those bus those bus services and in consulting in terms of um you know tweaking them and getting them right so they can provide what people needed but yeah certainly if, you know if this whole project goes forward there's going to be conversations going on for the for the next three four five years as things are developed and and taken forward okay uh, so Manchester is managing to deliver a franchise bus network without a uh, sustainable travel zone. Uh, why do we need to have the sustainable travel zone in Cambridgeshire, but we don't need one in Manchester? So Manchester has access to pots of money that Cambridge doesn't currently. Um, the, the, you know, the money we're talking about, the, the 50 million we're talking about spending on buses, um, there, there is no other source of income to fund that at the moment. Um, there's you know, 
that the money that Greater Cambridge Partnership has is, is one-off money. So they're, they're going to put 50 million into Pump Prime, some of this stuff. But if you just spent it on improving the buses and there was no income, then it would run out fairly quickly. Uh, and there, was, there, there is no current other sort of means and sources of funding for this area to do that. So that, that's sort of why we're in the, the position we are. But I think it's important to stress, it's not just being brought in to raise money. It's you know, the other primary aim, which is just as important. And without it, we wouldn't achieve the goals is to reduce the traffic as well. Um, so if you know, even if somebody came up a magic pot of money and said, right, you know, you can fund your buses, we still got to do something about the traffic congestion. Uh, we can't kind of duck that, duck that issue. So if we didn't do this, we'd have to do something else. And I think that's one of the things we're keen to try and stress because um, those of you who've lived in the Cambridge area, Cambridge area for, for some time will know there's been various iterations and conversations about ways to try and tackle congestion, but no kind of substantive decision made. So I suppose that's the point I'd make is that um, the money is important, but even if somebody gave you a, a Euro millions check to do this for the next five years, you still need to find some way to tackle the congestion or you won't be able to, to get where you need to get to. Okay. Um, so people are concerned that if we compare the incidence of accidents involving buses in London, uh, that we might see the same happening in Cambridge. Do you have a, an opinion on that? I think it's a, a rightful concern to have. And I think is um, if it goes beyond this point in terms of how you're looking to provide for cyclists with the space that's created on, on the roads, that's where you need to look at how you can get you know the right type of design so you've got safe junctions and safe mechanisms for, for, for bikes to get away with you know green signals and whatever to on busy junctions so you don't get some of those safety issues but certainly yeah the, the kind of the particularly in London the left turn movement for large heavy goods vehicles is, is one of the sort of the, the challenges and threats um, to people who are more vulnerable road users motorbikes and mopeds as well as cyclists actually as well but um yeah so will the Greater Cambridge Partnership reallocate road space to cycling even if the projected congestion reductions are not achieved? And will they reallocate road space even if that causes congestion to increase again? So uh, the whole bit around reallocation of road space is something that needs to be worked up in more detail. So the, the, the level we've got so far, we see significant traffic reduction and we're saying 50%. I think even if that was only 60%, um, sorry, if, 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 if that was only 40% or 35% traffic reduction, that would still be transformational. That should should allow space. Um, but I think, you know, the LTM 120 guidance that has been involved in cycling for longer, looking at, you know, sort of the sort of Dutch infrastructure approach is on busy roads. You need to have segregated facilities. Otherwise, if you want somebody who's eight years old or 80 years old or a non-confident adult to cycle, feel safe, they're not going to do so with, with a, with a lorry or a bus trundling along alongside them. So I think there has to be a way to deliver, you know, holistic network of segregated cycling, but we don't um, necessarily have the, the answer to all those questions about when and what designs as of today. But I think, you know, yes, we are recognising this creates the space. It creates the space for the 13 sort of city routes to be developed and delivered. Um, but I'm sure going to be need to look at, you know, measures beyond that as well. Okay, and a follow-up question to that is, how does the road hierarchy fit in? Um, would that all be in place at the same time as, as the sustainable travel zone? Um, no, they kind of work along in tandem. So I think the, the road hierarchy project is being developed. And I think to a certain extent, um, if this scheme went ahead, there may be different opportunities for that road hierarchy review to deliver things. And if this scheme didn't go ahead, then that road hierarchy review may have to look at, at different measures. So they're sort of, they're, their futures are sort of intertwined. But it, to a certain extent, you know, if you remove 50% of the traffic, then that road hierarchy can come up with maybe different solutions than it would um, otherwise. So I think that the two are going along inside each other. Um, and, and, you know, obviously this, this consultation will close in December and then there'll be decisions about whether this, this then goes ahead next year. Okay. Uh, what fare would I have to pay if I started in a village outside of Cambridge on, on a bus? and then changed once or twice within the city to get to my destination. So what we're saying is it should be a, a, a two pound single trip. So you can change bus and, and complete your journey. So the idea is you've got to, you know, you can make a, a trip um, and it will be the two pound as opposed to being multiple, multiple journeys, basically. Regardless of how many times you have to change. That, that clearly have to be some sort of time bound put on it, you know, so people couldn't be traveling all day because effectively that would be, uh, you know, um, but 
they'll it, it, the idea is that, yes it's two pound if you need to change buses you can change buses um and then there'll be uh, also we'll be looking at fare capping as part of the next stage as well so if you're getting returned but you know using the bus for multiple trips throughout the day you wouldn't keep paying two two pound or one pound in the city each time we we'll, would cap the fares at a sensible level so it may it still is attractive to use um, and the other bit we're acknowledging is we need to also have better range of things such as family tickets for groups and so on as part of the next stage as well so that if you're multiple larger groups of people it's still attractive to use the bus so there's more work to do is the honest answer but the principle is that the fares will be significantly cheaper and good value and they'll be capped and and they should work for people Okay, uh, where will all the new buses go when they get into the city centre? Uh, your map had a, a conveniently sized blob there. <laughs> so, a lot of the buses won't go to city centre into the new buses because we're looking at these new orbital routes and new new routes that come into to other places. Um, but the, the reason there's partly a blob in the city centre because um, it's part of the next stage as this project goes forward is there needs to be a look at actually that point of what's the, me the mechanics of where buses currently stop, uh, where could we fit more, uh, and how do we need to make it work in terms of some, you know, possibly interchange and, and so on. So um, there's not an easy answer, I think, as people will know, because most cities buses are already, uh, there's quite a lot of them, but I suppose the point which I want to stress is that of the doubling the bus fleet is not all going to the city centre. There's services going to rural villages, there's services going um, to orbital routes around the edge of the city as well uh, and some clearly would be going to city centre but the the nuts and bolts of how we need to re-engineer that city centre space is is a job beyond this really we need we need a sort of a, a decision to to proceed with the project to start investing in that sort of level of design in detail okay um so you've mentioned car clubs um at the moment, there are no car clubs out in the villages. Will car clubs become available in villages, not just the city? Um, I don't know is the honest answer. It would, be, it would depend on the market, I suspect, for the, the car club operators. So I think the, the aspiration would be that car clubs are available sort of universally, but I think they're their primary market, whether you look at how they, they've grown elsewhere. So I was involved. Uh, in Bristol in a previous going back in 2000 where we launched the first car club in, in Bristol and, they, and they, they do take time to build up and they are uh, obviously better suited to more densely populated areas so I think it's a will be a challenge for the operators to be operated in rural settings but they, they have been done elsewhere so I think it'd be an aspiration but I wouldn't sort of want to make wild promises that'll be car clubs um, everywhere um, because I think it'll be unfair and we'd need to work with the operators really to see what they think the, the business case and the model is um, for that. Okay, and a follow-up to that one, what about hire cars? You know, if I don't own a car, which I do, by the way, but if I don't own a car and I want to hire a car for a day in, in Cambridge, would I still have to pay the charge then? So under the current proposals that hire cars would, would pay, um, but the car club ones wouldn't. Okay. Um, are there any plans to introduce parking restrictions around the boundary villages like Fenditton, um, Milton, Girton, et cetera, um, in case there's the, the possibility that people just flog up the residential streets and then walk into the city. So we've we've been, um, we've acknowledged as part of the developer this stage that that's something we need to look at with those communities as part of the next stage um, of the project. Um, and obviously if it, that you could either look at proactively designing solutions um, alongside the scheme if it was decided to proceed with or you could wait and see what actually happens and take action if um you know if it, if it does cause to be but we acknowledge with any sort of charging scheme like this there is potential in some locations that people could park and walk um, um so we would need to to look at that in more detail as part of the next stage and as i said really have sort of engagement with those those affected communities to get their view on whether it's kind of a case of designing solutions now or a wait and see and respond and depending on what happens if the charge were to come in okay um probably a question for nick this one so you can have a, a little bit of a break but what efforts are being made to ensure that every household business in cambridgeshire bedfordshire essex suffolk etc know about this consultation hi everyone um this is i'd first say the biggest consultation exercise the greater Cambridge Partnership ever done and uh, probably the biggest, bigger than anything county have done for as well. Um, we've done, we are doing and have done an enormous uh, um, distribution of 
flyers and postcards to addresses around the county. Um, we've got a very large advertising plan and program as well that's going out um, far beyond the county boundary as well into West Suffolk um, and some of those other surrounding counties um, and utility authorities. Um, so yeah, I think it's fair to say that we are making every effort to spread word. Okay. Uh, certainly a lot of the questions we've had in uh, Facebook and, and Zoom have been around the fact that many people don't know if, you know, if they talk to people about it, they many people just have not heard about this. So, um, you know, maybe there's a little bit more to do there. Okay, a uh, few more questions. Um, so if the buses are not going into the middle of the city centre, how do people who find um, walking difficulty difficult or uh, you know have uh, mobility issues how would they get into the city center will there be a sort of a shuttle bus like there is at Addenbrooke's so that that's the detail we need to work out in terms of you know buses will go to city center but clearly we couldn't have a, a, you know, a, a doubling of buses terminating the city center itself because there wouldn't be the curb space or, or space to do so so that that's part of the detail to work out as part of the next stage really about how we reconfigure how buses access that central area I think the point I was trying to make earlier is that buses will be going to other places as well. So all the bit, you know, if you look at the way the city's grown, a lot of your big uh, destinations are actually not in the city centre, uh, you know, so the science park and so on. So actually it's important to get buses to access those locations without having to go in and out of the city. Uh, and also the buses will be going to connect into rural villages and to travel hubs as well for people to travel on within by bus and 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 all, all by park and ride, of course. So I think um they're good questions. We just don't have the answer to all of them at this stage. Um, OK, more aspirational question then. Is there a desire to have a traffic free city centre in due course? So that's not part of what's on the table now. Uh, so, uh, you know, I can't rule out from the, the politicians or the, the city council or, or, or partner organisations. That's something they want to look at in due course. But in terms of this proposition, we're not we're not proposing to make uh, sort of a, a traffic free zone as part of this this consultation. Okay, has there been any modelling on the likely impact of the sustainable travel zone on traffic at the weekend? Because my understanding is there's no charge at the weekend. So we haven't been looking at weekends. Uh, there, is, there, would, there will be no charge at the weekend, yes. So at the moment, the, the intention is to focus just on the weekdays, um, which is a, you know, a pretty big um, challenge and shift in terms of how people would uh, travel around in its own right. So I think we, we acknowledge um, that clearly there's a need to to look at the weekends. Um, London operates Saturday, but not Sunday. Um, so they didn't operate both days in in London. But um, it, it you know I think we we feel we feel for the the residents, the businesses, visitors, and so on. Tackling weekdays alone is, is a is a big big conversation. So you know, going beyond that would probably be um, a step too far at this stage. Okay, um, there's been no consultation on buses, on bus stops. Um, uh, is there going to be advertising on uh, bus stop uh, posters and things like that? Yeah, there is. there should be uh, posters on some bus stops around the city and on the side of some buses. Um, so you should start to see those and they should be around. Um, where they are held by a a private advertising company so we're not able to to cover them all um, which of course we would love to but yes okay um what are the likely costs of administering and managing the scheme um obviously you need to have resources to chase up payments deal with exemption requests um you know if i've got to take a child to a and e then yeah you know i've, I've got to fill in a form somewhere how how, how does that work so the way we, we, we would do it is we would try and encourage people to be on accounts, people who are residents or regular visitors to the area, so that you would register your car. So you'd then be able to pay through being detected from the cameras. And obviously, if you qualify for any discounts or exemptions, they would be applied automatically to that registration plate. Uh, for things such as access to um, A&E, um, we'd look at using you know, technology. So you, could, you have your, your, your iPad, they can register your, your car when you check into accident emergency. Um, some of the reimbursements will take more paperwork and we're sort of in conversations and starting those with the 
um, NHS providers, similar to the London scheme where people get reimbursed for um, hospital appointments, or whatever. So there, there will be um, some processes that are more um, administratively hungry in terms of the time they take, but the idea would be to try and um, encourage as many people to have accounts who are regular users so we can make it as streamlined and, and um, efficient as possible. Okay. Um, so you've mentioned that there's this two pound fare for a single journey. How far could that take me? So if you look on the um, on, on, on the consultation page, so places like Chatteris into the city centre would be two pounds. The pound is for within the city itself. So essentially anywhere outside the city would be two pounds um, and within the city would be a pound for your single ticket. So that's the kind of the broad, the broad geography. But if I got a bus from Cambridge to Newmarket, that would be two pounds. But then if I got a, a follow on bus from Newmarket, because that's in Suffolk, not Cambridgeshire, would I yes. just have to pay the local fare again? Um, at this stage, yes. Um, I mean, uh, there's a, sort of a broader aspiration about having more integrated ticketing across areas and stuff, but we're some way from that at the moment. But yes, the, the, our proposals are kind of covering the, the area, um, the Greater Cambridge area. Obviously, if people were travelling onward to other connections and they would have to to pick up the the, the charges and you know, the, the bus fares as applicable for those locations okay um probably another question for nick um how are you reaching out to young people students you know people who go to the regional college the sixth form college um we have got a big program um going on with all of the big sort of institutions um in Greater Cambridge, and so part of that is obviously the university. The University of Cambridge is a is a member of the of the partnership, and Anglia Ruskin is also on the joint assembly. So we're doing quite a lot uh, with them to engage their students, and they're supporting us and uh, promoting it to them. And then we're also um, working with the county to engage um, schools, particularly those inside the zone and outside. Um, so that includes the colleges as well. Okay, some more um, sensitivity analysis questions now. Um, what charge do you reckon would produce the largest income? How much traffic uh, reduction would that achieve? Um, so um, the, we've looked at £10 charges and they, they do generate more income and they, they reduce, I can't remember the exact figures now, but they, they reduce traffic by more than 50%. So they are... Um, they, they are a greater deterrent. As I said, we, we've tried to find a level of charge that we consider to be you know, in balance with the measures that need to be funded, but also that achieves the traffic reduction that we need to achieve as well. So yes, you could you could raise more money and you could charge more and it would reduce more traffic, but we think that wouldn't be fair um, because it's reducing traffic beyond the level we think is needed and it's raising more money than needed to fund the measures as well. And the, the powers that we have to do this um, through the, the Local Transport Act um are quite clear that they have to you have to be demonstrating that you're there to achieve a policy aim so you know the, the, the policies of the local authorities and it, it can't just be done as a, a revenue raising exercise so it needs to be achieving a, a congestion aim as well as funding the, the, the transport measures okay uh and probably the last question unless i receive a uh, another one in facebook or uh, zoom um very little of the recently built cycling infrastructure has been built to the current standards, the local transport note 120. Mm. Um, why not? And when can we be expecting that level of a, a good infrastructure to be built? So I, I can't give you an answer as to why not. I've not been involved in, in those schemes. So I know it sounds a bit of a cop out, but uh, you know, uh, that, that's a, an honest answer. Um, in terms of when can they be built to that? I'll be something, you know, new schemes should be built to that that standard as of from today and i know active traveling england on behalf of anything funded from sort of the, the government is looking to to review advise and uh, and provide comment on schemes they're developed so um from a professional sort of transport perspective i'd expect schemes to be start to come forward it are um consistent with that but in terms of the specific local response i'd need to probably defer and we need to come back to yourselves um is a is a group with a, a response from the, the local authorities would you consider buses going from one park and ride site to another 
uh, passing straight through the city centre. So we've been looking at services going from park and ride sort of round in, in orbital routes instead. Um, obviously, as part of increasing the number of buses running, um, running more buses across cities will probably be a more efficient way because it means you don't have to have buses stopping and laying over, you know, when they've got gaps between starting again in city centre. So one of the bit, one of the things we need to look at as part of the next stage is trying to run bus routes more efficiently in terms of um, their um, not requiring, you know, to lead to layover stop in city centre locations. So more cross city routes may be something which we can we we would develop to try and um, a provide those opportunities, but also b um, reduce city centre um, bus. Bus, buses having to lay over and wait between between their, their route starting and finishing. Okay, uh, another interesting question. Why is the primary aim of the sustainable travel zone traffic reduction and not climate change? So it, it we traffic reduction is one of the aims. If you look on the website, we, if we have a, a series of objectives that we're trying to achieve. One of those is about um, climate 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 change reducing carbon emissions but also improving air quality so there's a range of aims and, and one of the aims we keep trying to stress is also about funding and improving the public transport and sustainable transport measures it's not just about traffic reduction in its own right so we wouldn't be suggesting and um, the um the politicians wouldn't be wanting to uh endorse consultation on just a scheme that reduces traffic it does nothing to improve things so this is very much about a package i think people um you know, invariably want to talk about the bit they want to talk about buses or bikes or, or views positive and negative about the um the travel zone itself but we keep trying to draw people back that ultimately this is a package and you would you wouldn't do one without the other so you wouldn't do a travel zone um without the improvements to buses and, and you can't improve the buses without doing the travel zone so they are you know inextricably linked as a package and that's how it's been developed okay uh final question um, because we've had over 50 people uh, off across the various platforms and I, I can't remember how many questions we've asked, but a nice simple one to uh, leave you with. Why should people participate in the consultation and how were their comments about the details of what would or wouldn't work be taken on board? So why, why, did, why should they engage, do you say? Why should people participate in the consultation? This is a question we got asked. Okay. Um... People should should in, should should participate if they want to have a, a say on what we're putting forward. Really, you know, we, this this is a genuine consultation. It's going to be running, I think, is twelve weeks in total, and there's a lot of meetings, getting out to talk to people. Um, I, I, you know, we recognise this is a big change. It's not it's not an easy sell at times. You know, people are have got quite rightly concerns about it. Um, but we're we're saying that you know this this is a, a proposition that does have the opportunity to tackle some of the big issues that haven't been tackled. Um, not just in Cambridge, in, in many cities and towns uh, in the UK and other other places as well. So we recognise that it's got many plus sides. We recognise also there's areas that people are concerned about. But the only way we can really get people's views, is people engage and tell us what they think. You know, what they think we've got right, what they think we've got wrong, what we think we've missed, what they think they'd like to see instead. So you know, we we we're actively encouraging people to please um, you know do engage because. A consultation without views is not a consultation because we can only we can only consider what's sent sent back to us. So yeah, um, please do engage and tell us what you think. And we really do want to hear. In terms of what happens to it, um, with support of Nick and others, we have to analyze this consultation and obviously you know look at some of the responses and, and feedback. And we have to try and set it out um, fairly in terms of what what views have been said. Uh, and those views would then go to the decision makers, the politicians, who have to decide on whether they think on balance they should proceed, not proceed, or proceed with a, an amended proposition based on the consultation. So it will be a, a proper open process. Uh, the analysis will be open to people to see, and decisions made by politicians will be made, um, obviously, you know, in, in public forums, which people can make representations out in here as well. So, you know, this is a, a genuine um, commitment to the consultation and, and and we will work through the views and conversations and we'll see where this goes um so please yeah please do get in touch okay well thank you very much and i i must thank uh, alistair cox and nick sanderson for their time this evening and um without further ado i'll pass back over to roxanne and we'll do the rest of the normal camp cycle meeting thank you Thanks. Thank you, Alistair and Nick. Um, 
uh, I, let me tell you, you had uh, all of the Camp Cycle staff members behind the scenes gathering all of those questions across multiple platforms. And, and I will admit we were so overwhelmed with questions. We really hope that we caught everybody's questions. Thank you so much for answering them in such rapid fire fashion. Uh, but to those watching, if we have missed your question, um, you can email that to the GCP, the consultation address that was given earlier, or you can send it to CamCycle and, and we'll do our best to pass it on as well. Uh, but thank you everyone for, for breaking our system with so many questions. <laughs> um, as I mentioned at the, the start of the meeting, we have based our position and our campaigning around the sustainable travel zone on the feedback of our members. So CamCycle is a member-led organization. We sent a survey to our members and now I will hand over to Josh and I'm sure with the support of Anna um, to discuss what our members said. I'll, I'll put the, uh, the slideshow up now. Uh, Josh, our infrastructure campaigner, over to you. Thanks Roxanne. I'm looking forward to a, a lie down after uh, all those quick fire questions. Um, but yeah, so uh, we had a great response uh, from the member survey. So uh, over 200 um, respondents, 25% of them out the city and the, the headline numbers um, about supporting the, the principle of the sustainable travel zone. Um, just under 90% uh, either strongly support or support. Um, you'll see there. Um, and um, so just a really strong mandate um, straight off the bat. And then the, the survey went on to um, kind of dive into what some of the perceived issues are, what some of the R should be um, and the benefits. So just some top themes that came out of this, um, uh, some of the benefits, um, many of these we've kind of touched on tonight, but I'll just summarize clean air, pleasant environments, better public realm, traffic reduction, but the challenges of um, whether there's going to be enough public support and um, catering for journeys that um, still require for a car and how that will function um, and uh, how people can can kind of manage the zone and, and the level of opposition. On a slide. Um, so many, this is a question about the... Um, what's what's required to be in place um before the charge went in um so a lot of talk about getting the greenways in place which we've um many of the questions have been around tonight uh, and the call for safer junctions and a lot of this is feeding back into the consultation guide which is um very much progressed um and and just really that urgency for much faster progress on uh, a lot of the gcp schemes uh, and this is about public transport improvements. So um, talking uh, people raising concerns about bus drivers. And again, many of the questions we, we've covered and um, ensuring that we can have the kind of infrastructures to support that. So bus maps and, and planners and um, kind of information boards and all the things that um, members feel are important to support that road charging and the public transport improvements. And yeah, this is just about um, the benefits, what people are looking forward to, but also what people are worried about. So um, you know, there, there's a lot of um, concern out there, which, you know, uh, has been raised. Um, there's a lot of information to digest and um, a lot of information that um, people are finding difficult to, to come by. Um, so really lots of conversations about how we can get the word out, how we can be engaging in conversations with people, understanding their concerns, um, but also lots of stuff that we can look forward to if, if a sustainable travel zone comes off and that kind of transformational um, view of the city in the future. I'll hand over to Anna here. Thanks, Josh. Um, and just to say, um, as Josh mentioned, um, mo many of the or all of the comments that um, CamCycle members have um, given to us, we're a democratic um, charity. And it's really important your views. Um, so those will be going into our official uh, consultation response, um, but also our consultation guide, which we'll be putting out to help 
um, people answer and just sort of um, help summarise our views and, and, and sort of give you some ideas of some things you may want to put in your own response. But we would really encourage you to sort of give your personal feedback as well, to where wherever you live, if it's inside the city, outside the city, on the edge, um, do really give details, you know, of, of kind of cycleways, bus routes you'd like to see improved. It's really important um, to get that into the consultation. Um, and as part of um, our work around this consultation as well, uh, we've actually uh, joined uh, to form the Cambridgeshire Sustainable Travel Alliance. Um, so this is an organisation we have set up with Cambridge Living Streets. So that's the branch of the national charity that uh, works for walking uh, across the UK. Um, and we've also joined with the Cambridge Area Bus Users. Um, and this alliance is a growing alliance Alliance. Um, so um, Ely Cycling Campaign, we've got um, some national organisations getting on board as well. So we really kind of want to um, work together for sustainable transport across the region and make sure um, that people have a, a genuine choice um, and that it's sort of fair, integrated, accessible and fit for the future. Um, so if you find out a bit more about this alliance, um, you can go to camstravelalliance.org. Um, there's a little bit of a press release about the launch. Um, there's a bit about what we're about and there's a form to sign up. Um, so please do sign up there um, if you'd like to volunteer um, and get involved in, in our work to uh, promote the, the sort of positive future for sustainable transport and, and shape this consultation, shape what these proposals could to, could go into and, and make them as, 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 good as, as good as they can be. And then just uh, this is on to a bit of a, just an update. We always at the end of our monthly meetings, we always have um, a bit of a cycle and campaigning update. So this is just a brief thing. So this was um, from yesterday. Um, I, uh, this is the opening of the uh, or the renaming of the Equiano Bridge. It used to be called Riverside Bridge. Some people know it as the Tesco Bridge or the White Bridge, or uh, some people even called it the New Bridge before the Chisholm Trail Abbey Chesterton Bridge was opened. Um, but now it has been renamed the Equiano Bridge. Should we just go to the next slide? Um, so yesterday was the last day of Black History Month, um, and this was opened uh, with uh, the Mayor of Cambridge and Peterborough and uh, many other uh, guests. Um, Circles of Change is a local organisation that have been working to get this renamed um, in honour of, uh, I'm going to probably say the name wrong, Alauda Equiano, who uh, was a, a really leading um, anti-slavery campaigner um, who has links to the area. His, his uh, eldest daughter is buried in the nearby um, graveyard at St Andrew's Church um, and so um, this was yeah it was a very moving ceremony yesterday and um, there were sort of over 200 people came um, people walking and cycling past throughout to show how popular the bridge it was was um, um, but yeah you can find out a bit more on equianobridge.org.uk and, and thank you to yeah all the organizations that have been involved uh, for their work on this next slide um, we said there's obviously the um, sustainable travel zone is uh, our, the main consultation and that closes on the 23rd of December. So you've got um, just over seven weeks. Uh, we'll have our consultation guide up as soon as we can. Um, there's also uh, consultation, some consultations before that that close on the 7th of November. So there's not so much time on those. There's a, a consultation on the active strategy uh, for the whole of Cambridgeshire. So that is um, really, yeah, policies that kind of direct how um, which active travel routes will be improved and how how things should be um, designed to LTN 120 standard. Um, and so take a look at that. Related to that, there's also um, a, a transport strategy for Fenland and a transport strategy for Huntingdon. Um, if you live in those areas, we really encourage you to take a look at those and give feedback on those and how you think um, they match up to, to the active travel um, schemes that you'd like to see in those areas. So all of those close on 7th November and their Cambridgeshire County Council consultations, you can find that on their consultation website. Um, and I think we have also have links. If you go to campsite.org.uk forward slash consultation, we do have links to all three of those um, on our consultation block. Um, just a few of the upcoming events. Um, I know some of the people watching tonight are new to Cam Cycle. Um, so we have a variety of events. Um, we'll in addition to these, we'll be on our stall bike um, at the Mill Road Winter Fair. You can come and chat to us there. Um, we have a social on Tuesday, the 6th of December at the Alex on Guida Street. So that's a really great chance to just come along, say hello, find a bit 
more about what we do and, and kind of have a nice evening um, with a range of uh, members and, and the team, Camp Cycle team. Um, on the 10th of December, we've got a winter lights ride. Um, so we did this uh, last year, um, kind of bring it back um, after a great um, uh, Illuminate event that we'd had a few years previous. Um, and that was really successful, really popular with families. Um, and um, yeah, that's going to be really good. Just kind of look, decorating our bikes and also going on a, a tour of uh, Christmas lights around the city. So that's like an, a nice, uh, really fun thing to come and get involved with. Um, if you want to find out even more about what we do, um, the ideal event to come to is the Camp Cycle AGM in January. We're really pleased to have a great guest speaker, um, Detective Chief Superintendent Andy Cox, um, who is a really um, kind of leading person within um, the police force for um, breaking down the barriers, um, the barrier of safety, uh, really, to active travel. And it has, a, yeah, it's just an absolute expert in, in how to improve um, safety for um, people walking and cycling. Um, so do come along to that. And I think I'm now passing over to uh, Roxanne. Thank you, Anna. Uh, just a, a few a few notes about fundraising. Of course, we're, we're a local charity and it, it takes funds to, to do the work we do. And there's a, a few ways to give that are coming up at the moment. Um, there is a, a new cause, uh, Movement for Good, particularly aiming for eco causes. And they've produced a call out for people to nominate a charity that they think should receive £5,000 from their Movement for Good funds. So if you'd like to nominate CamCycle, you can do so, uh, eco.movementforgood.com. Uh, you can follow from there and find a way to nominate CamCycle if you think would be a, a good cause for a £5,000 donation. And for our regular CamCycle supporters, you will know we've got the Christmas challenge coming up yet again this year. So that is a week of fundraising where donations made to CamCycle will be doubled. Um, so please do put that in your diary. It's always a, a great success for CamCycle. However, this year uh, we are still short on our pledge funds. So if you or your organization or a fund that you're involved with could support CamCycle with a 5,000 uh, pound pledge to, to help us match those donations, please do get in touch. So that is the Big Give Christmas Challenge, uh, which is starting on the 29th of November and runs into the first week of December. Uh, a really big cause uh, across the whole country, raising funds for local charities and doubling those donations. Really important part of, of our work. And of course, uh, you can support CamCycle at any time. So if you want to support our campaigning work around the sustainable travel zone, you can certainly do that at camcycle.org.uk forward slash STZ. Uh, so thank you so much to all of those who continue to support CamCycle so we can keep doing the work that we do. We appreciate it. Anna, some big news. <laughs> 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 very quickly yes and um, we're really excited to say that we have reached um oh no Anna has frozen right at, at the big news I'll have to take over for you Anna we are so pleased to announce that we have reached 1650 members this week so it's a a new record for cam cycle um it's just really great to see that we're having an increase in support at this time it's it, you know we know there's some big things happening around transport in in cambridge so to see that reflected in more support for cam cycle is is wonderful um and we love seeing the reasons why why people join and that they're really motivated by the work we are doing at the moment so welcome to our new members um we hope your new member pack will be with you shortly um and another great record for cam cycle 1650 uh, how soon can we get to 1700 or even 2000? Um, that would be wonderful. So welcome to our new members. And I think that might be it for a rather epic CAM cycle meeting. Thank you so much to everyone who's joined us, who's asked so many wonderful questions um, and, and participated in, in, I think, our, one of our biggest online monthly meetings. We've had well over 50 people join us this evening. So. We'll have this online on, it's on Facebook. It will be on YouTube soon. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us and safe and happy cycling. And once again, thanks to Alistair and Nick for presenting and Robin for sharing all those wonderful questions. <laughs> Bye everyone.
Bye.